But the first speaker we have up is Professor Jason Potts from RMIT, who's going to talk to you a little bit about personal equity finance. Thank you, Jason. So I'm going to do two talks, as John indicated. The first one is going to be on a missing market in education. The second one will be a missing market in how we deliver tacos by helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> That's this. Um, this is actually John Humphrey's work. Um, I was involved early on in the initial planning of this, as was Joe Clark, as well, in sketching out this idea of how to fix education. Um, and this is a big problem that concerns a lot of everyone. Um, there's a lot of standard solutions to it, and pretty much all of them involve taking money from one group of people and giving it to the um, fund education. And um, Human Capital Project, HCP, um, if you've got any internet in your pockets, you can go there and learn about it this way. Um, I'll do a very brief introduction to it. I'm aware that many of you in this room have probably heard this before, and I'll sort of cover some of the themes I'd like to talk about why this is part of the classical liberal revolution. Um, first, what it is, um, it's a new way of, it's a new model for funding education. And what's interesting and different about it is it introduces a third party into this mix, which is a private investor. Um, that's, the new, that's the big new idea here. Um, the private, when we normally think about how education is funded, the person who receives the education student is usually also simultaneously the person that funds the education for their parents or their future selves if they're paying it through a debt system. But it's the person that receives it is the same person that funds it, um, unless it's the taxpayer. So this model is basically a new model to that. Um, HCP, Human Capital Project, has been set up as a not-for-profit organization. Um, John is director of it, chair of it, one of the two. Um, it's currently an experiment. We're not sure if this will work or not. We're trying it out and just see. Um, it's been running for about five years in Cambodia. In Cambodia, for reasons I'll explain soon, um, because we can. And it's a place where the education system is just most broken in the world there. So if it works there, it will hopefully work anywhere. Um, HCP is the organization and the idea, but it's based on a particular financial innovation. And that was the idea that we initially came up with, which is called a personal equity contract. And that's what I want to explain to you, this, how this new financial innovation, this missing market, can solve this problem and how this organization can do that. And I'll end with why I think this is more than just a... Alright, so three questions, three simultaneous questions. One, what causes escape from poverty? Two, why does underinvestment happen in education? And three, What's the difference between debt and equity finance? Right? Now, these are all, all three of those questions are questions that economists spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, many, many years. What HCP is about is really thinking about all three of those questions simultaneously. Right? So, you've had a bit of time now to think about how you'd answer those. Um, this is pretty much the answers that we came up with. Um, what is the main path out of escape from poverty for individuals, for nations? It's investment in education. That's why we care about this. Um, why does, what the problem of education, the reason that education has got government involved, in, involved with it in the first place, the reason that poverty is seemingly endemic in lots of places, is that education suffers what is allegedly a fundamental missing market. Um, and that market is essentially um, benefits come later, you have to pay now, and so on. So the HEC system, for example, is an attempt to address that missing market. <coughs> HCP is another, and we think, better solution to this. Um, it's the reason for the experiment. And the third question there was the one that seems completely unrelated. What I want to talk to you now about is why this is related. What's the difference between debt and equity finance? Um, well, this spelled differently. <laughs> um, the main difference is that there's not that much difference, and this is the point that we're building this on. Right? That if you can do something with debt, you can, you can do some degree of pokery and do it with, with equity as well. And what personal equity contracts are, the whole ATP program, is about taking something that's normally done with debt finance, I borrow money to pay for my education, and turning it into an equity finance model. And that's it. To understand that, you understand what's, what this is all about. Um, so I'll walk you through it. Um, 
Debt finance for education works kind of like this. Someone has some money. That's over here. Someone wants a degree. That's over there. Um, this person borrows money from that person. This person could be the taxpayer. That person could be future self. This person could be a private investor. Um, they borrow money for the person. They buy a degree. Um, that they've now acquired a degree, which is an asset, and they've acquired a liability, which is the debt. Um, now, on this side, the person has now created an asset, which is a seller liability, and in the future, this person with the liability pays that back, boom, right? So you know how debt works, I'm assuming. Um, pay attention to where the risk is, because yeah. this is what's new here. Right? Um, the way in which debt finance for education works, the way in which debt finance for buying a house works generally, is that all the risk is over here. <coughs> whoever is holding the uncertain assets, just you're not sure what this asset is going to be worth. A house may be a fluctuating value, a degree, who you knows what value you're going to get from it. But the person over here isn't really carrying risk in the sense of, they you know, they know what they're going to get back. They're going to get back interest rate plus whatever they like, right? Um, it's a certain mess. That's the current model we have. Applied to education, the problem with this, you, you see the problem with this model. It's not normally presented as a problem, but the problem is all of the risk is over this side. That's also your underinvestment problem. The reason that people underinvest in education is they're like, well, risky asset and debt, and just there's a lot of risk associated with this very first thing, the first decision. Now, X is one way of getting around that by um, turning the risk, um, socializing the risk. But there's another way. The other way is to turn this into an equity contract. What an equity contract is, it starts off the same way. Someone has got a dollar, the investor. Um, they invest the dollar, but instead of acquiring a known liability asset, which is the reciprocal liability, they're now an equity partner. They're carrying the risk. That's interesting. That's the new idea here. Is that now the risk is basically distributed. And presumably this person made this equity purchase because they wanted the risk in the first place. That's how equity contracts work in every other market. So whoever wants the risk buys the risk. Um, if they have made a clever decision and this, have chosen this investment well, they'll get a return. If they haven't, they'll lose. But look what's also happened now is that this person has the asset, the education. Um, if it works out for them, they're going to have to share this with this. Um, because if it doesn't, it's not. So that's really the, that's it. That's, the, that's the, the, the basic idea of reforming education. It's not rocket medicine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is an idea that's been around in other equity markets for hundreds of years. It's just, for some reason, it has never been applied to really, probably the only place it's really obvious that it should have been applied to. Um, this, so so these, this is differentially priced, is that right then? Well, that's one of the ways we can deal with that. So, I mean, I'm just, this, this is a simplified version of it. The experiment that we're running is to try and figure out whether that's possible, what sort of market would need for it. But in principle, yes. In principle, it's, it's an option we bid for it, and so on. In principle, it would be continuously priced, that it would be traded, and so on, and tranche it up. Um, but that's the big idea here, is where we're taking a, a problem that is globally a problem in terms of underinvestment in education because of the way risk is apportioned, turning it into an equity contract, solving the risk problem. Um, all right, great. So that's it. All right, if, if, if we've seen what we can do with that, now we can just look at, well, okay. And what? Um, if we can develop these personal equity contracts, and that's what the experiment is about, developing this, we can develop HCP as an organization. If we can do that, um, why would this work? Well, just first of all, the economics of this is pretty sound. Um, it is, the incentives are all in the right place. Um, interestingly, it actually encourages these students to be more risky in the choices they're making. They're more likely to actually make a decision um, that, you know, that oh, I, I'll do that instead of this one over here, um, in the expectation that I'll get a higher payoff. Now, if they um, aren't right, it's the investor that loses, not debt. So, weirdly enough, you actually want the students to be taking more risk. You don't want them all studying commerce. You want a few of them to be trying to do engineering, someone might do um, down school, and just get a little bit of um, It distributes the risk efficiently. It's a huge achievement. Um, it's contract based with 
potential market feedback, and this was the point about once you've got this initial contract, a whole lot of derivative contracts can follow on from this, and secondary markets can develop, and that carries information about the differential value of these different degrees at different points in time. Markets carry information. The fact that we've got missing markets here means there's a lot of missing information, so prepare for that. Um, and this is just private provision of public goods. Why do we care about that? Well, this could potentially scale. So at the moment we've got one instance, 30, 40 students in Cambodia, more than the hundreds. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but at the moment it's been run as a charity because we're trying to see how that works. But this, this potentially scales. And the bigger this gets, the better it works because it's largely about trying to take um, more information. Um, the bigger it gets, the more efficient it will become. Um, as it gets bigger, new properties can emerge. Again, um, housing, housing markets that are this big work this well. The ones that are twice as big work more than twice as well because there's more information, there's more liquidity, and so on. Um, so there's reasons to expect that this thing could potentially turn from a small charity that some of you are invested in to a global source of, um, of funding for education for millions or billions of um, turning it into something that institutional investors, pensions, hedge funds might pick up instead of it being a government and tax situation. And here's what I think is interesting about this. If that's the case, and if the reason a lot of poor countries are poor is a kind of underinvestment in education, and we're dealing with this currently with foreign aid by giving their governments money and hoping they spend it well, um, we can basically turn this into a kind of foreign direct investment. Um, Australian pension funds can invest in Cambodian children directly. Um, or not. All right, so that's, 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 the, that's the implication. Now, um, I think as a business case, that's pretty interesting. But as a, from a libertarian perspective, I think it's also interesting. And the reason here is that if we've seen this scaling out aspect, the how does we get out of poverty aspect, we we'll see there's three things all intertwined here. There's, um, economic development, there's foreign aid, and there's education. Now, all three of those things are things that the state really, really likes to do on a big scale, and is usually trying to get things out of it. Um, the reason Cambodia is that the country was, somewhat still is, just broken in all of those three ways. There wasn't really a lot of government in the way, so there was space for this to, to emerge. Um, the success of HPCP um, is potentially crowding out the state in this situation. I think that's the promise that this can, this can offer. All right, I'll finish there and talk about Taco Bell this later.